Next up is uh, our panel, routing around catastrophe, securing BGP, anti-spoofing, and more. I'll hand it over to our moderator, Christian O'Flaherty, and uh, we'll take it away. Thank you. Hola. Bueno, buenas tardes nuevamente. El próximo panel tiene que ver con eh, catástrofes de ruteo, sería la, la traducción al español, eh, o, o, o cómo evitar las catástrofes eh, relacionadas con ruteo. Y estas catástrofes tienen que ver algunas veces con fenómenos naturales y muchas veces con fenómenos humanos y de configuración. Algunas veces intencionales, las malas configuraciones, otras veces eh, delictivas. Entonces vamos a tener dos partes en el panel. La primera parte del panel tiene que ver con cómo eh, distintas situaciones, eh, en particular terremotos, afectaron la infraestructura y el ruteo en, en dos países de nuestra región, en Chile y en Haití, y qué lecciones se aprendieron de esas situaciones de catástrofes reales, de, de, de catástrofes naturales que impactaron la infraestructura y cómo afectaron el ruteo, y qué lecciones se aprendieron. Y luego vamos a ver eh, cómo prevenir esas otras catástrofes en el ruteo que tienen que ver con malas configuraciones o eh, malos anuncios que afectan muchísimo al servicio de Internet. Actualmente, Internet es mucho más que una... Eh, red de servicios y es fundamental que el ruteo sea estable para que Internet funcione bien. Entonces, por eso nos tomamos cada vez más seriamente cómo hacer seguro y robusto el ruteo en Internet. Entonces, le voy a pedir a eh, nuestro primer panelista, todos son expertos y mu tienen muchísima experiencia, en particular, eh, Rodrigo pasó por la experiencia de eh, administrar una red durante un terremoto y quisiera que nos comparta eh, sus experiencias y aprendizajes. Voy a dejar que cada uno de ustedes eh, se presente. Yo solo diré el nombre, ustedes van a decir de qué organización son. Ok, eh, bueno, mi nombre es Rodrigo Drenas, soy administrador de, de routing en, en NIC Chile. Eh, llevo más o menos 10, 15 años en esto. Y para, en honor del tiempo, empezar el tiro. <risa> bueno, en NIC, el. Me perdí, perdón. Ya. En el 2010 nosotros tuvimos un terremoto, como ustedes todos saben. Llevábamos más o menos 25 años esperando que tuviéramos este terremoto. El último fue en 1985, ahí están los datos. O sea, fue bastante grande para Santiago. Y en el 2011 tuvimos otro temblor de 8.8 cerca de Concepción. Este gráfico muestra, solo para que tengan una idea, la magnitud de energía liberada ese día y cómo se distribuyó por el mundo. ¿Okay? Santiago está en la zona donde se apuntan las flechas. ¿ya? Es una cantidad de energía tremenda. ¿Ya? Yo creo que casi, salvo la gente que estuvo, ha estado en terremotos, yo creo que ninguno de ustedes es capaz de imaginarse el no poder estar parado. Y ante esa situación, uno trata de prever toda la cantidad de respaldos posibles y aún así, no necesariamente es suficiente. Cosas como que los racks caminen, que los cables se atoren, son cosas que uno, por mucho que ha previsto, sucede igualmente y se desconectan equipos, se desconectan routers, que todo está razonablemente bien. Ahí, por ejemplo, ven algunas imágenes de lo que pasó, o sea, de lo que quedó de, de algunos destrozos. Las imágenes son impactantes, sin embargo, en Chile el impacto mayor no lo causó el terremoto, sino el maremoto en el sur, por desgracia. En esta gráfica pueden ver a los mayores operadores de, de, de Chile, de cómo estaban los prefijos nuestros de NIC Chile distribuyéndose al mundo, ¿ya? por Entel, por Telefónica, por Telmex y por Orange. Esto es sacado de BGP Play, que varios de ustedes lo deben conocer. Justo después, justo después del terremoto, más o menos. Esto fue 13 minutos después del terremoto. Como ustedes pueden ver, hubo proveedores que simplemente, o sea, por algunos proveedores nosotros simplemente dejamos de aparecer por el mundo. No quiere decir que el proveedor no haya tenido conexión a Internet. Quiere decir 
que nosotros como NIC Chile no llegábamos a ese proveedor. Algunos de los proveedores decían que nunca se cayeron, básicamente, pero los, las conexiones internas, ya sea la fibra, los transversores o algún tipo de conversor que nos unía con los data centers, simplemente no tenían respaldo de energía. Y finalmente, esta imagen muestra... Eh, nosotros tenemos un, una copia del root F en Santiago y ustedes ven la cantidad de consultas que tuvieron esa semana, o sea, ese día, en particular el 27F, en donde... Va, perdón. Hablé por las puras. Eh, ahí está la imagen de, de, después del terremoto. Va, ¿por qué? Me falta... No, no, no importa. Ok. Sorry. No, a veces a, a cambiar la imagen. No importa. No, no, pero es mi problema. Entonces, eh, como ven, el terremoto dejó esto. Eh, perdón. 13 minutos después del terremoto del temblor, eso es lo que se ve. Nosotros quedamos comunicados básicamente por telefónica y eso es en Santiago. Sin embargo, en Concepción en particular, perdimos toda conectividad más o menos por un día y algo. ¿Cristian? Gracias, Rodrigo. El formato del panel va a ser eh, primero una pequeña presentación de cada uno y luego vamos a hacer preguntas a los panelistas para ver qué cosas aprendieron y qué cosas cambiaron desde ese momento. Quisiera darle la palabra ahora a Max Larson de Haití. Disculpas por la, por la introducción, estaba todo en un solo archivo y por eso fue que eh, hubo una confusión con, con la presentación. Ahora vamos a pasar todos los slides para llegar al primer slide de, la, de Max. Muchas gracias, Christian. That's all I can say in, in Spanish. Sorry, guys. So, my name is Max Larson Henry. I'm from Puerto Prince, uh, Haiti. I've been involved uh, the last couple of years in uh, helping the Haitian Exchange Point and also the um, CCTLD, local CCTLD.ht. And I've, been ser uh, I've served uh, four years as co-chair of the Lightning Public Policy Forum. So the objective of this presentation is to um, give an idea about the impact of the earthquake um, in January 12, 2010 in, in Haiti and also um, explain why it is important to, to, to think ahead, uh, adopting best practices to make sure that the network is robust and resilient because people during catastrophe um, or during those, those tragic event, you know, use um, a lot of uh, t uh, telecommunication. So this slide is from the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, there are uh, other stats sources, but this can give us an idea about the, uh, the, the impact of disaster, um, loss and damage um, toll in terms of people um, that death, and also uh, economic loss. 
for us, it is, it is important in our area of concern as network engineers, as operators, we need to make sure that we, we help not only before, during, but also after um, uh, to, to help maintain um, telecom infrastructure to uh, help deal, deal during those uh, events. So in January 12, 2010, we had the, this earthquake in, in Haiti. You have pro probably heard about the, the toll in terms of um, human um, life lost, um, 300,000 people. And from an estimation by the Haitian government six months after the earthquake, the, the damage and loss um, from an economic perspective was uh, 150 million US dollars. Um, regarding the uh, telecom infrastructure, a lot of internet service providers lost their some infrastructure, um, base station and at some sites. The incumbent teleco this time uh, lost the housing of its, its main facility where uh, they have the switching cent and also the landing sta station for the submarine cable. But what we can, we need to put some emphasis on, uh, on this uh, as before the earthquake, most of the operators identified some uh, interesting site um, in just in terms of coverage and identified those sites as um, an interesting spot to install base station. We, without uh, strict analysis on the fact that those houses, those, uh, those facilities might not be uh, earthquake proof to receive telecom uh, infrastructures. So what happened uh, during the earthquake, 40% um, of those uh, base stations or those sites collapsed with the, the houses where they, they were installed. Um, right after the earthquake, uh, most of the operators notice uh, an increase of, of traffic, mainly from um, international uh, diaspora, um, people living in the, in the States, in Canada or in France, trying to, to reach their relatives in, in Haiti. So that uh, um, uh, lead to several congestions on, on mobile net, net network. Because most of the ISPs in Haiti at this time um, uh, where wireless internet service providers, it was the, the telecommunication services uh, was restored very rapidly. It is estimated that 98% of the services um, were restored less than six months after the, the earthquake. So what we learned from, from this event is that telecommunication is, is, is key uh, before um, disaster, to help prepare disaster. In some cases where we have hurricane, um, civil society organization use telecom infrastructure to alert uh, people that are living in um, uh, vulnerable uh, areas. Uh, telecommunication is key also during and after disaster to help rescue team to, uh, to, to reach people or uh, people that are affected by the disaster to, um, to call to uh, seek help. So it is important for network operators, uh, engineers, uh, companies, telecom companies, to uh, think about improving um, uh, network robustness, to have um, a resili resilient network to face those uh, uh, disasters, and also to have a plan to repair base station and other key uh, element in the telecom infrastructure. It is also important for um, different actors, ISPs, um, cellular operator, to um, put in place collaborative frameworks through um, local network operators group um, and also ISP association 
because what we um, see is that it is easier to, to collaborate um, during disaster if we already have a framework that uh, uh, help with, with uh, discussion. Also, um, what happened during the, the earthquake, uh, the, one of the key sites in, in port au prince area where all the ISPs um, has their facility was not affected by the earthquake. But uh, um, the generators, um, because this site was not, uh, could not be powered by the, the, the grid, the generators at some point needed fuel. Uh, it took some time to locate facility where we can get fuel. And then when we need to transport f fuel, we uh, find out that the, the, the wood was, was cut. So th this is an important uh, issue when planning for, for disaster management to, to think about the, the, the whole chain. Um, power is also part of uh, telecom infrastructure and it, it, it can be, it is critical to think uh, about it. Um, one of the key things, as we mentioned it earlier, is to, uh, for telecom operator, operators in countries such as Haiti, we, uh, as high risk in terms of uh, earthquake, to think about selecting the, uh, the facility where they are going to install base station and, and tower, making sure that those uh, houses, the, those facilities are earthquake uh, resistant. Uh, and for that, they need to uh, uh, apply um, standard and, and, and protocol um, when um, building those such infrastructures. Regarding the services, uh, the, the core infrastructures, router and physical infrastructure are important. Uh, also, the, the services, key services, are also important like uh, um, DNS for the uh, local CCTLD. In fact, during the, the earthquake, we had two uh, servers located in, uh, inside the country, and the, the, the facility where they, they were host collapsed, uh, and so, does the, uh, so did the, those, those two servers. But because uh, the dot .hc had um, at least two um, secondary servers located outside of the country, and also an uh, ENICAS uh, node operated by, by PCH. The, um, we had continuity of, of service regarding uh, that uh, HC. Um, following the earthquake, uh, we put emphasis also um, uh, on the the, the necessity to reinforce uh, local infrastructure, like, like the uh, internet exchange point, bringing more members, and also um, content providers. Thank you. Gracias, Max. Eh, entonces, esta primer parte era para mostrar el impacto que tenía una catástrofe real. Y ahora vamos a ver que catástrofes que son a veces responsabilidad de nosotros como operadores pueden eh, impactar tanto o más como las catástrofes reales. Y vamos a ver que hay herramientas. Entonces, para estas que son evitables, vamos a ver qué herramientas deberíamos tener en la red para eh, protegernos al menos de aquellas que nos podemos proteger. Así que le voy a pedir primero a Gerardo Rada que nos haga una eh, introducción a la primera parte. Hola, Gerardo Rada de la CNIC. Sí, una de esas catástrofes, eh, el tema del secuestro de recursos puede ser considerado una, una catástrofe de esta que, que nombra Cristiana. Eh, el secuestro de ruta se produce cuando algún BGP hablante hace un anuncio de una ruta para la cual no tiene autorización. ¿Sí? Esa, 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 ese anuncio puede ser de una red eh, que no sea asignada por los registros o de una red... Que, que no tenga que estar viéndose en internet, una red privada o una red de otro operador. ¿sí? Ese es el caso donde más dolientes aparecen, ¿no? cuando 
los, los, los clientes detrás de un proveedor de servicio no pueden llegar a algún contenido y los que brindan algún contenido no pueden brindarlo a los clientes que se quieren conectar. Eh, voy a presentar muy rápidamente tres ejemplos o cuatro ejemplos de ese tipo de, de casos, de secuestro de rutas, ¿sí? que se producen de la misma forma y que eh, con fines distintos y con resultados distintos. ¿sí? Un ejemplo de, de secuestro de rutas puede ser los agujeros negros que, que se han presentado ya en varias ocasiones. Por ejemplo, en 2010, eh, China Telecom hizo, anunció todo el, todo el internet desagregado en barra 24, con lo cual absorbió cerca del 15% del tráfico global. ¿Sí? Eso fue promedialmente, o sea que eh, seguramente los, los proveedores que estaban cerca a, cercanos a China Telecom se vieron afectados en un, en un porcentaje mayor. ¿Sí? Otro ejemplo de secuestro de rutas puede ser el, el, el spammer, ¿sí? el envío de spam. Se, hay estudios que, que demuestran que los spammers están anunciando redes de otros proveedores, ¿sí? envían spam y luego desaparecen el anuncio. ¿sí? Sacan beneficio de que las redes que están utilizando para enviar spam son redes que están fuera de listas negras y, y, y los anuncios son realizados por corto tiempo, entonces son difíciles de rastrear y de, y de detectar. Un ejemplo más, este año se presentó el primer caso que yo conocí de, de ataque del tipo de secuestro de rutas con fines eh, económicos, fines maliciosos. Hasta, hasta este momento, todos los ataques que habíamos conocido, que yo conocía en, en mi caso, eh, tenían que ver con, con errores de configuración o, o de algún tipo. Sí, entonces, este año se presentó un hijacking donde por 14 minutos realizaron un anuncio, esnifiaron un tráfico, lo modificaron, reenviaron y se robaron 83 mil dólares en Bitcoin. ¿Sí? Y el último caso que les presento es este, el de hijacking, el clásico que se presentamos en todos los eventos, que es el de YouTube y Pakistán Telecom, ¿Sí? donde Pakistán Telecom eh, anunció un anuncio, realizó un anuncio más específico de una red de YouTube y este, terminó absorbiendo el tráfico que iba dirigido a YouTube. Pakistán Telecom se quedó sin servicios y YouTube se quedó sin dar servicio a sus clientes. RPKI es una alternativa para mitigar los efectos del secuestro de recursos. ¿sí? Hay otras formas de secuestrar rutas y RPKI en particular con lo que está ahora realizado y cómo funciona, eh, protege sobre un ataque específico, que es el, el ataque al origen. ¿sí? Entonces, una, una de las cosas que podríamos hacer nosotros como operadores es, bueno, brindar información sobre quién es el ASN autorizado a originar nuestras rutas. Y bueno, eh, los que trabajan en, en proveedores grandes, que interconectan a muchos otros proveedores, capaz que está bueno que también implementen validación de origen. ¿Sí? Gracias. Gracias. Gracias, Gerardo. Y esta es una de las partes que hacen más robusto y confiable el, el ruteo BGP. Quiero invitar a Wes a que nos eh, cuente qué eh, parte es necesario agregarle RPKI para tener una solución completa y confiable. Thank you. Um, so, in the IETF, the CIDR Working Group has been working on getting the RPKI out. There's actually tools available now, but unfortunately, it's only half the story in the long run, and I'm going to explain why um, in the next few minutes. So, the RPKI protects your paths Through, by doing origin validation. In other words, you can be absolutely certain where um, something originated, where the, the, the first AS in your path actually came from and that it was authorized to release that route announcement, which is all great, except that it's actually possible, unfortunately, still to lie. So we're going to see in a minute. So the diagram that you see in front of you shows two green routes Um, that are coming from four and going all the way to one. So when, when AS1 is trying to uh, send packets back, um, there's nothing stopping it originally if five had authorized a much shorter route. And, and I'm making a very easy case here where the only thing we care about is path length. We all know that there's many more complex algorithms for making decisions. But for the point today, we're only going to talk about path length as being the important one. So. In this case, the RPKI would protect it, and it would make the red line invalid, because a five didn't have the authorization to release the IP address route you know, starting from server over in AS4. Um, so this is RPKI working. It's, it's saying it's invalid. Um, but what happens if, if AS5 intentionally lies? 
they intentionally say, you know what, I have a path to four, and it just prepend, it, you know, starts with itself as the second hop. And unfortunately, the RPKI isn't designed to, to solve that problem. It's designed to make sure that the very first uh, path component is correct. So in this case, they end up all becoming valid, and in my very simple diagram, because a more complex one won't fit on the slide, um, you know, two of those route advertisements shown at the bottom from one, two, five, and four to four, as well as one, two, three to four, both end up becoming valid. So this is where the next step in our process lies, because um, AS4 has to prove not only that it started the route, but it must prove that the next hop, the only next hop possible is to three, and then three has to show that the only next hop beyond it is the next one. So you end up with a chain of validation that must be necessary. And no other router, you know, can reuse or copy portions of that path link. So we need to, we need to make it fail at, at any point if, um, if individual decision points along the way are not algorithmically and cryptographically showing that, that they actually are the next valid hop so that nothing can be copied. Um, so this is where BGPSEC starts in. And so BGPSEC is farther behind. Um, when the, the IETF was working on, the CIDR working group was working on both the RPKI and BGPSEC, they realized that origin validation needed to happen first. It was more important to get that piece. And that will actually prevent a lot of configuration mistakes, but not necessarily prevent all of the active attacks if there are any. So with BGPSEC, you now begin to determine that that path is invalid because you, you would know that, f that five was not authorized to be the next hop down from four. So that red line at the very bottom, which five was pretending to have a route to, is in fact invalid. So I don't mean to be um, you know, terribly negative here, but RPKI is sort of one step and, and BGPSEC is the next. And, and my advice to you is learn the RPKI now, begin to get it deployed, and many of you have done an excellent job starting down that path but realize that there's more coming. So rather than learn it all at once, I do encourage you to start with the RPKI, and as, as time goes on, we'll need to move into securing the path component as well. And they're very married together. So the, the RPKI and the BGPSEC both have a certificate tree that supports them, and you've seen similar diagrams to this um, this week already showing, you know, LACNIC with ISPs underneath it and certificates underneath it that are given to the, to the ISPs um, to to authorize uh, their routes uh, through ROAS. Well, the BGPSEC actually changed that same certificate tree. So once you have the RPKI certificate tree in place, BGPSEC actually starts uh, providing cryptographic assurances down to the routers. And you can see that there's four routers down below. And the, the origin validation is step one along that. And then the path validation provided through BGPSEC uh, protects the other links in the chain all the way from the server to the client and, and back and forth, of course. Um, and that's it for me. So that's just sort of the future. I'm, I'm not talking about, uh, we have no idea if some of these past attacks were intentional or configurational mistakes because we had no cryptographic proof. In the future, we'll be able to tell exactly who somewhere in the path something went wrong, which will be highly helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Y vamos a abrir el piso a, a preguntas ahora. Tenemos una primer pregunta en el micrófono. Eh, les pido que por favor digan su nombre. Please say your name before your question. Ian George. Um, I would just like to, to add and to mention uh, the RPKI. It's really, really easy. Uh, I'm running the Go6 lab back at home, and I decided to uh, sign the resources and set up the RPKI validation. I needed 17 minutes from the scratch, from zero, to build up the validation and to sign the resources and be done with it. It's really easy. You just need to read the manual and just do it. Thank you, Jan. Um, voy a hacer una pregunta. Um, Rodrigo Arenas, eh, sobre el, el ruteo en particular y mm, ¿qué, qué aprendieron, Rodrigo, luego de, de un impacto tan grande y, y qué cambios hubo o por lo menos qué cambios tienen planeados para eh, tener mayor estabilidad si es que pasa algo similar otra vez. Eh, bueno, nosotros de esa experiencia fuerte la mayor cantidad de... O sea, nosotros no perdimos mucha cantidad de equipos fuera de línea. 
básicamente perdimos conectividad porque hubo enlaces que se cayeron, no, por, no porque hubo rupturas de fibra, sino más bien porque en, los proveedores no tenían respaldo en las llegadas de las puntas de fibra en, o pasaba por puntos que no tenían respaldo. La única solución que nosotros finalmente decidimos tomar, porque no, Nick Chile no es una empresa muy grande y no tiene tanta... Como, no puede ejercer mucha presión a los ASP. Entonces, finalmente lo que decidimos es aumentar nuestra capacidad de enruteo y distribuyendo mayor, de, mayor, de mejor forma nuestros servidores y tener más conectividades a distintos o a sea, los mismos distribuidores, a los mismos ISPs, pero por distintos puntos, tratando de esa forma de que la llegada a ese ISP estuviera mejor respaldada. Gracias, Rodrigo. Los invito a hacer preguntas, si quieren, alguno de los panelistas. Eh, me gustaría hacer una pregunta a, a Gerardo relacionado con el, el despliegue de RPKI. Eh, sé que eh, hubo una muy buena experiencia en Ecuador, fue presentada antes en, en, eh, por, por Carlos Martínez y actualmente es una especie de, de, de país líder. Eh, Seguramente hay apoyo de, de LACNIC para replicar eh, esa experiencia en otros puntos de intercambio de tráfico. Quería saber cuál era el, el ofrecimiento o el, o el pedido. Bien. Sí, a partir de la, de la experiencia de Ecuador, eh, el equipo que trabajó en esa, en esa experiencia, Álvaro, Roque, eh, Fabián y yo, Carlos y Arturo también estaban en ese momento, hicimos un draft informativo en la IETF recomendando cuál es la, la forma de despliegue de RPKI a nivel global. ¿sí? Nosotros, a partir de esa experiencia, determinamos o pensamos que la mejor forma de despliegue de RPKI a nivel global fue esa que, que hicimos allí. Básicamente fueron dos días de capacitación y eh, con, invitando a los operadores de, de, de todo el país. Eh, después de las capacitaciones, bueno, una vez que la gente entiende cómo funciona, entiende de qué nos estamos protegiendo y cómo se resuelve el problema, eh, básicamente quieren protegerse. ¿sí? Entonces, luego de la capacitación, creamos los, los ROAS para, todo, para un porcentaje muy alto de los operadores en Ecuador. Y además, en el punto de intercambio de tráfico, se implementó validación de origen. ¿sí? Eso fue básicamente lo que comentó Carlos y, y Fabián hace rato. Lo que la CNIC, y a partir de ese documento que hicimos, lo que estamos es replicando esa, esa recomendación, esa forma de implementar RPKI en otros lugares de Latinoamérica. ¿sí? En particular, este año, lo hicimos en Costa Rica, en Venezuela y en Colombia, ¿sí? con resultados similares a los, a los obtenidos en Ecuador. Entonces, básicamente cualquier eh, país de la región que, que quiera hostearnos, que quiera colaborar con nosotros en, la, en, el, en el despliegue de RPKI, que quiera colaborar con nosotros y con ustedes mismos ¿no? en el fortalecimiento de la, de la infraestructura, este, podría eh, escribirnos a nosotros y bueno, organizamos un taller de ese mismo tipo en, en algún otro lugar de, de Latinoamérica. El mensaje sería entonces que ya está eh, decisión de los, de los operadores empezar a usarla y, y no, hay que, no hay necesidad de esperar. Ahora la próxima pregunta sería para Wes, eh, si tiene algún conocimiento del estado actual de bgp y cuál sería el mensaje a los operadores si quieren eh, comenzar a hacer alguna prueba. Y además si sabe de algún caso real de, de, de uso en, en una red. Um, so first off, uh, with respect to being able to deploy either technology, you know, because the RPKI is still um, fairly new, I do recommend that anybody that's deploying RP, RPKI actually talk to their, you know, if they have difficulties, if, if it's portions of it are difficult, to let the tool vendors know so that the next person down the line is, is better off. And that's definitely going to be true for BGPSAC too, because it's even less out there in, in real code. The specifications in the IETF are just wrapping up probably in the next six months. They'll go to an RFC. Um, but the, the code is even less um, full. A coworker of mine has a fully working version of the bird router and uh, Quagga is not far behind if, if they're not actually up and running. And interoperability testing is just about to start. So we're much, much farther behind, unfortunately, in terms of actually getting to the point of being able to, to deploy it. So is there a way to uh, play with BGPSEC as there is currently with RPKI because operators can uh, sign their prefixes, create the ROIs, do a lot of things without uh, any uh, threat 
to their operation. You see the, the, the equivalent on BGPSEC? You definitely can, and, and I have personally taken um, some virtual environments and connected them together with like our bird router. If you go search for bird in BGPSEC, you'll end up landing on our our page where we up, uh, offer a patch to Bird, and it'll eventually be rolled into the Bird uh, main core as well. But you know, I've set up virtual machines in, internally and done it. Um, and like anything else, uh, like like the same thing you do with RPKI, you can you can decide what to do when you get an invalid, you know, result. Do you actually want to drop it, or are you only going to log and monitor it and watch what's going to happen for a while before you start making hard decisions with it? So it's the same thing with with Bishop Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Entonces, te, tenemos una, una pregunta más. Hola. La misma que hiciste, Cristian, eh, creo que no fue respondida. ¿Se tiene alguna idea del, del estado de despliegue de RPKI solo? Eh, hay varios números que tenemos por allí. Álvaro hace rato mostró una estadística de despliegue de RPKI en Latinoamérica y es cerca del 25% de las redes anunciadas en Latinoamérica están, están protegidas, o sea, están cubiertas por robas. Y... ¿Cuál sería una posible razón por la cual los operadores no, no están haciéndolo? ¿Hay, hay alguna no sé, implicancia? Sí. Lo, lo que yo he visto, yo tengo 3, 4 años ¿viste? asistiendo eventos y presentando RPKI, lo que he visto es que cuando la gente entiende cómo funciona y qué es lo que resuelve y que no van a romper nada, eh, se les quita el miedo y hacen lo que tienen, hacen los robas y, y se y, y informan sobre, sobre los ESNs autorizados. Entonces, sí, hay, mientras hay, la, gente, la, gente, la gente no conoce bien cómo funciona, parece que es complejo, hay cosas que no se saben muy bien cómo funciona, o sea, no, desconocen el funcionamiento, hay temores y básicamente no lo implementan por eso. Creo que viene por ahí. Entonces, técnicamente no, no, es, no hay mucho riesgo, es simplemente ir y configurarlo. Sí, de hecho, eh, Ecuador tiene un año y tanto configurado todos los robas de, de, de ese país, además están descartando rutas y los operadores en Ecuador siguen brindando servicios sin, sin, sin problema, ¿no? Lo mismo pasó ahora este año en Venezuela, Colombia y Costa Rica. Ahora, ¿tiene algún sentido si es que, por ejemplo, el código de los equipos que tiene el cliente no soporta BGPSEC todavía? ¿Tiene algún sentido ir con el despliegue de RPKI sin BGPSEC o mejor es esperar y hacer todo de una? Creo que en general la, la recomendación en cuanto a tecnología es tipo hacer cosas de forma paulativa, ¿no? paulatina. ¿no? Entonces, este, ya te estás protegiendo de algún tipo de ataque específico implementando RPKI y haciendo validación de origen. Entonces, creo que por ahí viene la recomendación. Gracias. De nada. ¿Otra pregunta más? Sí, no tengo. Eh, Álvaro Retana, Cisco. No tengo una pregunta, tengo más que todo un, un, un anuncio. Eh, ya que estamos hablando de BGPC, del RPKI, del IATF, de que todos queremos participar, eh, en la reunión de Hawái, el grupo de BGP, que es el grupo de IDR y el de CIDR, van a tener reuniones conjuntas. Porque el desarrollo del protocolo de BGPSEC ha sido en CIDR, no en el grupo de BGP. Entonces, claro, ahora quieren trabajar juntos para asegurarse de que de verdad funcione. Mañana, eh, y la intención no es hacer un secuestro de la reunión, pero mañana a las 11 de la mañana, hora local, hay una reunión interina, virtual, del de grupo de ITR, el grupo de BGP. Y esa reunión es para preparar al grupo con la teoría de BGPSEC. Entonces, lo que va a haber mañana es una reunión que es un tutorial más que todo sobre qué es BGPSEC, cómo funciona, cuáles son las los, eh, ventajas, desventajas, etcétera, para que en la reunión de Hawái, entonces ya haya una reunión más educada. Entonces, si a alguien le interesa saber cuándo y dónde es la reunión y todo eso, me pueden enviar un correo a álvaroencesco.com o me pueden preguntar y yo con mucho gusto les doy eh, la información del, del acceso. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Bueno. Hola, Silvia Chávez de CUDI. Eh, en vista de que no hay ninguna implicación técnica para implementar RPKI, eh, y bueno, en México tiene que ser a través de NIC México, pero en la parte de los operadores, ¿quién tiene que hacer esa difusión? ¿Quién tiene que hacer esa labor de convencimiento hacia los operadores para utilizar RPKI? Hola, sí. ¿Quién tiene que hacer la labor de difusión y de... Y todos, me imagino, ¿no? Eh, creo que el, la construcción de Internet es colaborativa. O sea, lo que hacemos en este tipo de eventos es tipo colaborar entre todos para tener un Internet más robusto y, y más seguro. Entonces... 
creo que desde este tipo de eventos y desde el, la participación de cada uno contribuye a, a un fortalecimiento global de, de toda la infraestructura. Entonces, es cuestión de cada uno de nosotros eh, hacer nuestra parte. ¿sí? Si, desde el punto de vista de los operadores, bueno, crear los ROAS, los que tienen IPs, crear los ROAS también. Los puntos de intercambio de tráfico, que son lugares ideales para implementar validación de origen, bueno, hacer su parte. Operadores grandes que no, tengan, que no se conectan a puntos de intercambio de tráfico, bueno, implementar validación de origen ahí. Entonces, es como todo en Internet, ¿no? Este, o todo ese funcionamiento de Internet que es colaborativo y, y con responsabilidades distribuidas. Es mi opinión. It's, it's a very hard problem in the same way that IPv6 has taken a very long time to deploy. And that the RPKI and BGPSEC are also, you know, one of those things that a few early adopters will begin to take it up and will begin practicing it and go to the workshops and go to tutorials and learn how to do it. And it, it'll eventually come, but it's not, it's not something that's going to happen in a year. It's going to take some time. And, you know, our, the best thing you can do is convince all of your peers to do the same thing. Ask them, have, you know, have they uh, signed their previous sales with and got them allocated? Um, and different areas of the world are, are in very different states. Actually, the, this, this area is much, much more ahead than the rest of the world, to be honest, if you go look at the numbers. Hola, eh, Carlos Martínez de LACNIC. Quería hacer eh, dos comentarios. No, no, no comparto exactamente de que el despliegue de RPKI este sea particularmente lento, en particular en nuestra región. Creo que, creo que va mucho más adelantado el RPKI que el IPv6 si comparamos la, eh, las relativas edades de ambas tecnologías. O sea, ¿cuánto hace que existe el IPv6? ¿Como 20 años? ¿Casi 20 años? Eh, y RPKI eh, de manera usable, eh, no más de, de 3 o 4. Dicho eso, creo que conviene hacer una distinción en lo que es estrictamente el RPKI de lo que es la validación de origen. Una es una funcionalidad de los routers, la validación de origen es una funcionalidad que, que se ejecuta en los routers, y el RPKI es básicamente una base de datos, con, con, más, eh, con más decoraciones que una base de datos normal, pero una base de datos. Eh, claramente crear entradas en esa base de datos no implica ningún riesgo operativo al día de hoy. Eh, la validación de origen en los routers quizás está un poquito menos probada, diría yo, aunque como comentó Gerardo, eh, NAP Ecuador la está ejecutando hace más de un año sin, sin mayores problemas. Pero conviene a veces hacer, eh, tener claro que son dos funciones distintas que, que existen en distintos lugares de, de, de la infraestructura de Internet. Bueno, gracias a todos, gracias a los panelistas y cualquier duda que tengan encontrarán los panelistas hasta el último día del evento. Así que muchas gracias. Um, moving along, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, TLS. It's called Lock It Up, TLS for Network Operators. And uh, you're going to have to deal with me again. So I'm going to uh, kick off here and again talk about TLS um, from the perspective of, of network operators. Obviously, TLS is typically something that we see as maybe more of an application, um, web developer kind of thing. And I think there's reason for network operators as well to pay attention to TLS. So the first thing I want to talk about is a lot of times TLS still gets called SSL, um, myself included. Uh, I think SSL has kind of been ingrained in our minds for some reason. And a lot of people, when they talk about HTTPS and, and, and encryption on the web or uh, across the internet, they talk about SSL still. But really, the last version of SSL was 3.0 in 1996, which is obviously quite some time ago, right about when the internet really started to, to become commercialized and take off and, and when many of us maybe have found out about the internet. Um, so we've actually been using TLS since then. And uh, TLS 1.3 is the current version that's being worked on right now. Also, I want to kind of set the stage that TLS is not just for websites. Right? I mean, that's one of the things I think we most often recognize that when you see the HTTPS in your uh, URL 
and you see the little uh, lock icon maybe in your browser that shows that you have a, an, uh, an encrypted uh, web connection. Um, but it can also be used for email, instant messaging, uh, file transfers. Um, it's a VPN encryption protocol as well as being used in voice over IP and, and really any, any kind of application you wanted to use. Really any data transfer over the internet can be encrypted using uh, TLS, transport layer security. It's really what it's for. One of the reasons why this has become a lot more prominent in a lot of people's minds recently was uh, what, what people are calling the Snowden revelations, right? Edward Snowden um, in 2013 revealed that there was this massive, um, basically spying operation going on, right? This pervasive monitoring, we've, we've come to call it, where governments around the world, the US government in particular with Edward Snowden, but we found that other governments have, as well have been doing this and probably other bad actors um, are using um, various techniques to com completely monitor all traffic on the internet. Um, maybe not quite, right? There's a lot of traffic on the internet, but potentially everything was, was being monitored. And so people started seeing TLS as a much more important feature in all of these uh, web locations and, and data transfer services because uh, obviously many things we send across the internet, maybe we don't want to be monitored. We don't want to be captured um, by anyone or by particular people. So there was a huge response, right? We've seen things, uh, articles, um, efforts, uh, the EFF jumped in, um, you know, the HTTPS ev Everywhere campaign was put on by a number of websites, uh, surveillance, self-defense. There's been a number of initiatives started, um, a, number of, a, a ton of press about this, and uh, basically everyone kind of woke up and said, okay, we may need to actually really worry about you know, web security, encryption on the internet, and start paying more attention to these things. Um, the IETF and the IAB were, were no exception to that. They also saw this as a problem and uh, have, have since published RFC 7258, which is titled pervasive monitoring is an attack. And as that name suggests, it basically goes on to detail the fact that the internet community, the internet engineering community, sees this pervasive monitoring as an actual attack against the internet. Um, that this isn't something that's just passively going to be accepted, it's something that is actually um, an active threat to the internet. Uh, and of course that's prompted um, a review within the IETF across basically every working group. So all, all, all areas, all applications, all, all protocols um, are kind of looking at now how security plays a role and how we can defend ourselves against pervasive monitoring. One of the things that's come out of that one, one of the big efforts is UTA, working group within the IETF. Uh, UTA stands for using TLS in applications. Um, there's a number of goals listed here. Really it's kind of a review of, of TLS and how to update um, the representative application protocols, um, you know, including how to communicate with proxies, between servers, between peers, um, and then, you know, client server obviously as well. Uh, it's looking at creating best practices for TLS use, um, forward secrecy, um, various cipher suites, and, and, and many things, as well as potentially looking at a way for an application client and server to uh, um, use unauthenticated encryption when they can't uh, authenticate. So if, if, you know, a big, big piece of the space is, is kind of watching UTA and, and what goes on there, I think, as we move forward. Not just related to that one group, though, within the IETF. Um, the TLS working group, obviously, is, is, as I mentioned, is currently defining TLS 1.3, which we'll probably see that become an RFC, um, an actual standard, this year or early next, I think. Um, and then also HTTP biz, which biz is Latin for, for second or for next, and so the HTTP Biz working group is looking at how to build HTTP 2.0, the next version of the hypertext transfer protocol. And one thing we do know is that it will only work with TLS. So once we move to an HTTP 2.0 framework, you will only have HTTPS um, URLs or URIs, and um, everything will be using TLS. So and I call this out again as a kind of a, from the network operator perspective, this is something that you really need to pay attention to, right? TLS isn't something that's just gonna go away or that you can kind of keep your head in the sand. Um, there's also more protocols. Uh, Speedy requires TLS to work, and Speedy is a way to um, speed up web page load times, basically. Uh, and then also, we've seen recently Google just started using HTTPS as a factor in their um, ranking algorithm. So sites that are using TLS get ranked slightly higher than ones that aren't. Um, it's a really low weighting right now, but it is there, and it is something that's, you know, hopefully will also encourage adoption. And so again, for, for all of these reasons and more, we'll see TLS more and more uh, out there in the world. One of the big things that just happened at the end of last month, um, a company called Cloudflare, which uh, 
does kind of front end for websites. They do load balancing and, and things like that and DDoS prevention. They just launched universal SSL, they're calling it. And basically they've given a certificate and set up for using TLS um, for all of their websites. So over 2 million websites which are currently using Cloudflare now have um, TLS encryption available to them for free. There's other organizations doing similar things. So again, one more piece that we're, you know, we're gonna continue to see TLS become more and more prevalent. When I start to talk about TLS, um, some people will often point out some of the recent things we've seen as far as problems. Um, so when I say, you know, we need to use TLS, they'll say, oh, well, you know, there's bugs and there's vulnerabilities and so maybe we don't. Um, Heartbleed in April 2014 was one of those um, where OpenSSL uh, had a problem in the libraries. Um, and, and so this kind of called out two things. One, the fact that you know, so many people were using SSL, open SSL, the one specific, you know, implementation of, of TLS. Um, so, so diversity in using those libraries was a big thing that was called out there. And the other thing to point out, right, is that this has been fixed, right? It was seen and it's been taken care of. Uh, and then Poodle, excuse me, um, was another one in, in September of this year, just last, uh, sorry, September of this year, just last month, um, which we saw that the SSL th version 3.0, which we saw at the beginning, this is a protocol from 1996, um, yes, that doesn't, it's not very great. It needs to be deprecated. We shouldn't be using it anymore. Um, it's old and it has, has many problems. Um, there's a, the EFF puts out this encrypt the web report. And as you can see now, um, most of the big websites, most of the major websites, you know, kind of the, the name brand websites that you might name off if you were just kind of going to list off some websites, um, are all using TLS for the most part across the board. You can see there's, there's only one red box there and just a few gray ones. Um, so this is happening, right? TLS is, is expanding in usage and, uh, and really has already kind of taken over in a large part a lot of the bigger players. So what, what does this mean for, for network operators, right? How do you, how do you help your customers? Um, I think you, your customers are going to be using TLS for their applications and um, you, know, you wanna know how you can support them. One thing is obviously you probably wanna use TLS for your own services and systems. Um, so you, two things, right? One, you're now encrypting your information, which is great. It allows your customers to be able to use encrypted communication with you, uh, over the, whether, it's, whether it's, you know, uh, email services you provide or just on your own, you know, customer portal. Also, of course, allowing TLS encrypted sessions to flow through your network is, is gonna be paramount. Uh, if you try to block TLS, that's probably not gonna work anymore because so many things are gonna be TLS only, especially as we go to HTTP 2.0, where there is no option other than TLS. If you're blocking encrypted sessions, um, you're gonna completely black out some websites, right? And then of course, provide education for your customers as well as for internal staff. And that's one of the things going back to number one, using TLS on your own services and systems breeds familiarity within your organization so that you can help your customers if they call in and have questions about these things. Um, so then you can do this education towards your customers, how they move their servers and clients and things to support TLS, um, you know, their applications and things like that. One thing that pops up um, really quickly as we start to use more and more TLS, right, is a lot of network engineers who work at uh, operations companies use Wireshark or other tools to do packet inspection, to watch flows and things like that. And yes, that does not work anymore uh, in a TLS world, right? So if we're actually doing um, TLS on everything, right, if, if, if all data transmission across the internet was using TLS and was encrypted, you've basically rendered Wireshark and tools like that completely useless because all you're looking at is encrypted data and you can't see what's actually going on. You don't get to see those headers anymore and you don't get to see what's happening in those packets. Uh, unfortunately, these tools that we have used typically for network management in the past are the exact same tools that can be used by um, people who are monitoring that traffic or who want to you know, do bad things. And so in order to have these, you know, basically they're back doors. In order to have these things open to where you can look at the traffic, that means anyone can do it. And so in order to secure the internet, we also have to uh, lock ourselves out a little bit of some of these tools and find different ways around it, unfortunately. So really, the, I guess the key takeaway here is that your network management strategy needs to take into account the fact that TLS is going to be there and it's going to be a growing concern. So with that, right, how do you educate yourself? How do you educate your users? There's a lot of resources out there. Um, the Internet Society through the Deploy360 program has some. Uh, it's right at slash deploy360 slash TLS. Um, there's resources to, to learn more about TLS. There's some basics there. There's some links to libraries and other tools. And then, of course, our blog, we cover um, kind of ongoing news and events and things that are related to TLS. So that should be a pretty, pretty big resource for you there. Bettercrypto.org is basically a white paper that's published uh, at this website. Um, it, it really good. It kind of goes through um, 
across the board of, of how to secure um, crypto, uh, how to use it, TLS, and uh, re really a good, good document that I recommend reading if you're interested in kind of getting a good overview of, of TLS and, and how it all works. The uh, Mozilla server-side TLS document is great for more than just Mozilla. Um, it talks about, um, again, it's kind of a, a setup guide from their operation security team um, to talk about how to navigate the TLS landscape. So again, a really, another really solid resource on TLS information and, and as you, go, you get into um, configuring servers and things like that and setting up TLS, another one you should probably look at. And again, more than just Mozilla applications are covered there. Um, the United States um, National Institute of Standards and Technology has also published a paper. Uh, I don't know if you've seen one of these before, but when NIST puts out a document like this, a lot of times there's some really, really good tutorial content in there. Um, these tend to be fairly thick documents, but, um, but good, but solid information. So again, if you have time to, uh, to read through it, or, or you know, at least your operations security team, definitely take a look at that document. Lots of uh, good, good tutorial information. Um, there is a challenge with TLS, right? So in order for it all to work out, you have to know that the TLS certificate you're getting is actually the correct TLS certificate. Uh, if you get the wrong TLS certificate, then you're basically, you're, you're encrypting traffic, but you don't know who you're sending it to, right? So there's, there's authentication and encryption that are needed here in order for this to work. Um, in order for me to speak to one of you, I wanna make sure that I'm talking to you first, make sure that I have your certificate, and then we can start exchanging encrypted uh, information. Um, the next talk, right after this one, is gonna talk about Dane which is gonna talk about how that, how that works and how TLS can be uh, a little bit more secured by taking care of that authentication piece using Dane and, and DNSSEC. Um, but before we get into that, before I hand off to uh, another speaker, I'd be happy to take any questions on, uh, on TLS for applications and how it relates to network operators. Lo siento, solo hablo un poquito de español, so uh, voy a hablar inglés. Uh, Robert Seastrom, Aaron Advisory Council. Um, could you go back to your slide that says, but what about, please? Yes, I think so. If the slides can come back up, please. We shall see. While we're waiting for it, I'll start talking about yeah. the content of it. Uh, you talked about it's not possible to do the decryption of packets with Wireshark. And in fact, that's true on the surface, but that's not an attribute of TLS. That's an attribute of the key exchange algorithm that you choose to use. Hmm. When the FBI came looking for Ladar Levison at LavaBit, the reason that they were interested in him handing over his private keys was that the key exchange protocol that he used did not have what we call perfect forward security. It's a, it's, it was a reasonable thing for him to do because he wanted to support older browsers. But if you're willing to not support older browsers, which is a good idea to force people to go to newer browsers that have all the bugs patched, what you want to do is only offer ciphers like Diffie-Hellman Elliptic that allow key exchange that has perfect forward security. And what perfect forward security means is that if you don't have, if you have the certificates that are used for authentication to the website, they are useless for turning the crank backwards and getting sausage out of, getting cows out of the meat grinder. So it is useful to have a cipher, uh, a key exchange protocol enabled that does not have forward security for debugging purposes. And Wireshark knows how to debug those, how to decrypt those packets and show them to you. So you can see what's inside the packets when you're debugging. However, it's a threat and a risk to run in production without having appropriate uh, uh, key exchange protocols in place Wikipedia has a very nice article on forward security, and I Excellent. wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, thank you. And I will now, yeah, thank you. And I'd now like to bring Wes Hardiker back up to talk about Dane and the future of transport layer security, kind of continuing on this theme.
lo siento porque yo no he hablado mucho español en 20 años. <laughs> so I will be speaking in English. <laughs> you will like that, trust me. <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking today on, on DNSSEC and Dane and uh, how it helps TLS, which Chris just described. So first off, qu quick background about me. I work for Parsons. Um, I'm in our cybersecurity uh, research team. And specifically, I'm the technical director of our network uh, security research group, which is why I speak on multiple uh, security protocols all the time. And uh, we are a bunch of infra infrastructure specialists on DNSSEC and the RPKI and BGPSEC and SNMP and IPSEC and all those types of things. Uh, we've recently launched a DNS and DNSSEC monitoring service called DNS Sentinel. Um, if you want a demo later, let me know. And then I do a lot of open source software. Everything we try and do, we try to put out to the public good as much as we can. So I'm the, the lead creator of NetSNMP and also of DNSSEC tools. And I'm heavily involved in the IETF. So, so quick overview. I'm going to talk about um, current TLS anchoring problems and why, we, why Dane came about and, and how is it going to help. And then I'm going to talk about Dane and a few protocols that are making use of it, like using the web and SMDP, XMPP, and what's not listed on that slide is SIP. So Chris already talked about TLS, so I'm not going to go into it. Um, but just think of TLS as a tunneling protocol between two applications. That's the easiest way to think about it. And note that, that traditionally it's used on TCP. DTLS works with UDP, and Dane and DTLS and Dane and, T and TLS both work the same way. The important thing here is that TLS provides a few things for you. It ensures that eavesdropping is impossible, people can't sniff your packets, that the client is connected to the correct server, but this only works when it's properly anchored. In other words, when you've, you have a proper security tree above you. And the TLS certificates become those trust anchors, how you how you go about proving that you got to the right place based on a, on a large hierarchy, similar to the RPKI, but, but um, even with a wider top uh, for, T, for TLS. And a server must present an a X509 certificate when it um, gets presented, when you first make the connection. It presents a certificate and says, hi, I'm www.example.com, and here's my certificate. And then the client checks that certificate. It says, did it present the right name? Is, it, is the certificate name actually www.example.com? Did it present the right address? Is it really 10001? And was it signed by a CA, a certificate authority that I trust? And so the certificate authority tree is very, very important. And what that really means is that somewhere high in the certificate tree, there is a certificate authority. And its job is to sign child certificates. And it should verify those childs to make sure that they really are who they say they are. Do they own the domain? Can they make a change to prove that they own the domain? Are they using their legal business name? There's a whole bunch of validation stuff that I won't go into on how, you check, how the CAs check their children. And if, if the CA is willing to do all that stuff, they can become a trust anchor. And TLS clients then trust those trust anchors to, to bootstrap the whole security system. So all's good, right? And CAs are always trustworthy. Well, the problem is, is that there's a lot of CAs. And there's been evidence in the past where some CAs make mistakes. Um, some CAs have been tricked. And that's routinely a problem. And modern web browsers, for example, have 1,300 trust anchors associated with them. And that's, that's a lot. And any one of them can issue a certificate, for example, .com, and the client can't tell the difference. The client doesn't know if the right CA gave it to him or if somebody tricked this other small CA into issuing one instead. So the, TL the, the TLS client ends up accepting both certificates, no matter who they came from. So this is where DANE comes in. And DANE stands for DNS-Based Authentication of Named Entities. And it introduces a new uh, DNS resource record called TLSA. Um, TLS, you know, the A really doesn't have any meaning behind it. Um, people even proposed a TLSB at 1.2. And it indicates the correct certificate that you actually want to talk to. And we'll talk about how that's done in a minute. 
it has to be DNSSEC signed. It's useless if it is not signed in the DNSSEC tree because you can't trust the record out of DNS. If it's signed all the way through up to the top of the DNSSEC tree, then everything's good. So it really marries the DNSSEC tree to the X509 tree. It makes them uh, work together. And it's defined in RFC 6698 from the IETF, and it was later augmented by 7218, uh, which I'll describe a bit in a minute. So now that we have the, the DNSSEC tree on the left-hand side, starting from the root and going down to com and going down to example.com, which publishes a TLSA record, and all of that is signed in the DNSSEC side, it shows that the example.com certificate can only come from one place because the DNS entry only points to one certificate and the other one is actually proven invalid even because it came from the wrong CA. So what does it look like? It's ugly, <laughs> like all DNS records, especially with uh, lots of base 64 text. But the top part is the name and it always begins with a port number and a protocol. So port 25 in this case is for mail. Um, it would be port 443 for the web, for example. And then it's prepended, um, the port number and the protocol are prepended to the domain name, example.com or whatever it is you're looking up. Then there's the common T uh, DNS attributes that you're familiar with, like the TTL, the class, and then the type is the TLSA record. The three, the one, the one are, are TLSA parameters. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Uh, 311 is one of the most common ones that you'll see. There's lots of different variations there, and we'll go over uh, what those actually mean in a second. And then finally at the bottom is a whole bunch of data, and what that data is depends on the three, the one, the one, and the one. So those parameters in this case are three things. There's a certificate usage field, which says, which is the three in that 311, which says which certificate should we match against? Which one in the tree should we point at? And we'll get back to how you pick that out. There's a selector field. Are you gonna match the full certificate or are we only going to match against the public key inside of that certificate? And there's reasons for doing one or the other. And there's also a matching type field. What is it we're gonna match against? You can actually publish the full certificate or the full key in the DNS and you can say match exactly. Or that becomes very long and packets become too big and you end up fragmenting DNS. So we don't recommend that. So there's also um, SHA-1 and SHA-256, where SHA-256 is the recommended one to use, but you can use one of the other ones if you like as well. So that will take a SHA-256 of the certificate or the key. So here's the example. 311, I'm going to go in reverse order because I think it makes more sense. The TLSA matching type, as I just said, is um, a 0, 1, or a 2, and the 1 is SHA-256 and zero is full and, and two is SHA-512. And what that really means is that the, that data section is either going to be the full certificate or a hash of the certificate or the SPKI. So the field before that indicates what you're actually taking a hash of. Is it the full certificate? If it, if it is, it would be a zero. Or if, is it just the public key in the certificate? Do you not care about the rest of the attributes and whether they change? You only care about the public key, the cryptographic public key is that exact one. And so um, the, a lot of people think that, the, that doing just the public key is sufficient because then you can change the certif certificate out around it, but you're still making sure that the public key that's bootstrapping your cryptography is okay. So I don't think you ought to memorize these numbers, by the way. The important thing is that you try and think about which one you know the best. It's impossible to keep all three sets of numbers in your head unless you work on this stuff nonstop. So think about the situation that makes sense to you. You've probably already thought, well, I like SHA-256 the best. Or, you know, I don't know, I'm still thinking about the, the full certificate or not. Eventually you'll come up with a pattern that works for you and you don't need to, to remember the rest. Um, the certificate usage field, which is the three, is slightly more complex, and this is why I did it last. A zero means that the, that the, uh, the data is going to be pointed at the public CA from the entire X509 tree. So it's not pointing at your certificate, it's pointing at the right CA that you should make sure you are chaining up to. If you, if you end up chaining up to a different CA when you're validating TLS, it's incorrect. A one is PKXEE, which says that the end certificate 
is what you're pointing at, but you still have to validate to some other known trust anchor. You can't skip the whole PKIX validation process. You still have to go back to one of those other 1,300 CAs that you had before. And then two and three are sort of the flip side. We're actually going to discard the PKIX tree. We actually don't care about it. We only want to make sure that we are chaining to something that you're going to specify. So a two says, I have this private CA. You probably don't even know about it. You, you client have never heard of it before, but this is its fingerprint. As long as you can validate the chain of trust up to that fingerprint, you're OK. The, the server must distribute that private CA certificate with the exchange, however. And then three is the easiest. It's the simplest. It's the fewest mistakes to make in code. And a lot of people believe it's the most trustworthy because you're saying, this is my certificate. You don't bother with figuring out the whole chaining process. All of that goes away. It's very simple. This is my certificate. So this is sort of the diagramic, uh, the, the diagram approach to the same thing. If you have two trust anchors, one's a private one and one's a public one, uh, the zero points at a public trust anchor. The, the, the one value points at the, the end certificate. The two value points to a private trust anchor. And the three value also points to the end certificate. But the difference between one and three is with one, you still have to follow the path up and validate that that whole chain works. And three, you're just saying, this is a certificate. Don't bother with any of the rest of that. So that was, that was the hard part. <laughs> let's go on to a little bit of uh, making it easier to actually use and understand. So let's talk about using and deploying it now. Um, it's actually quite simple. There's a, um, there's a package called Hashlinger, which is produced by Paul Wooders and um, actually up in Canada. And he, creates a, he has a TLSA script to generate records. And you can very easily just pass it a bunch of stuff. You can say, I want you know, 3, 1, 1, with, and give it a certificate. And it prints out the DNS record that you need to go put in your zone, and you're done. You go drop that in your zone, and you're done. You can also use it to connect to a server and say, give me the, the DNS record for the server that's running with a live certificate. It'll pull down the certificate, grab it, and figure out what it should put. That's obviously less secure. Make sure that you have a very secure path to that certificate if you're actually going to use that for real security bootstrapping. So let's go on to, OK, how are we going to use this in the real world? So that's all the how to get it up and running and how it works. Let's talk about HTTPS first. HTTPS suffers the most from the too many uh, certificate authority problem. They have, they're the ones with 1,300 certificates in their browsers. Um, so deploying Dane requires a few things. It requires serving the TLSA record. Uh, it's fairly easy. How to do it is defined right in the RFC. And the script I just showed you shows you how to generate it. It's actually very easy. And there's not that many people publishing it yet, but I've heard that there's a lot of people watching. And when there's enough of them out there in the world, then infrastructure will start changing. So I've been told. Here's the problem. Um, a lot of the web browsers have thought about this problem. And they have decided that Dane isn't something that they want to do right now. And that includes Google and Mozilla and um, Safari. And part of it is because doing those extra DNS requests takes time, and they're very interested in getting the screen to the user as fast as possible. There's some thoughts on fixing that, but for the immediate time being, they don't have plans to, to do Dane in the client. Um, there are some plugins that you can use. There's plugins you can install that will put a little lock icon up in the, up in the URL bar if, you, if it's Dane compliant. Um, the problem is that those plugins don't actually check everything. They don't check an image URL. They don't check a JavaScript URL. And obviously, that can be a problem. So I, have, I, I tested it actually just earlier today to make sure they haven't solved that problem yet. Um, if you go to www.dnssectools.org, you'll find that we'll show you when your, your DNSSEC is not turned on. And those, those plugins, unfortunately, uh, do the same thing. We have a web browser called Bloodhound um, that is based off of Mozilla. We took the, the library, the DNS library, and modified it so that it works with DNSSEC and it works with um, Dane. Uh, the Dane support is not entirely done, but it, like for 311 certificates, it definitely does work. Um, that's freely available. You can go download it from the DNSSEC Tools uh, website if you like. And it works on OS X, Linux, and we're working on, on Windows. Um, port <laughs> compiling compiling um, Firefox is not easy. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> 
So anyway, the web is hard because the, the, a lot of the web browsers have decided we're not going to do it yet. So eventually that may change, but for the time being, they're not interested today. On the other hand, here's the good news. Dane and SMTP, really, the only way to secure mail is through Dane. There is no other path that will end up working in the future, and I'll explain why. Um, so first off, quick overview on how mail works. I, I assume most of you know this, so it'll be a very fast overview. But, you know, Alice on the left-hand side sends mail to, a, to its uh, mail server in its ISP. That ISP's mail server sends it to another mail server, Bob's ISP, and then Bob downloads it. The only part that I'm going to talk about today is between the two servers. Um, Alice sending it to her server is usually via a pre-configured mechanism, and that's fairly secure today. And Bob downloading it through IMAP or POP is, is also done with sort of pre-configured security, and it generally works. There's people talking about doing Dane for that, but that's further in the future. I'm only talking about how to get from Alice's ISP to Bob's ISP. So it works something like this. Alice's ISP says, hey, Bob's ISP, where should I send mail to get to Bob? And then Bob's uh, DNS server responds, oh, you should send it to mail.bobsisp.com. And the mail transfer agent sends it to, um, sets, opens a connection to Bob's ISP and says, hey, I've got mail for Bob. And Bob's ISP says, hey, great, I'll accept it. I, I really wish it was that easy, but it's actually much worse. <laughs> that was about as simple as I could draw the diagram. But the reality is that there's multiple DNS servers. There's Alice's mail server doesn't actually ask, you know, her, uh, doesn't actually ask Bob's ISP directly for the DNS records. It asks her own ISP, and that asks Bob's ISP. And there's a lot more lines and arrows, as we'll see in a second. And there can be multiple mail servers, too. So the reality is, and I'm not going to talk through every line on this, the situation is a lot more complex. There's a whole lot of networking traffic going on to send mail. There's multiple mail servers, multiple DNS servers, multiple resolvers, and that's, uh, it gets complex. So back to this list of, I wish it were so simple. The important thing to take away here is that there's multiple DNS servers, there's multiple resolvers, and there could be multiple mail servers. So where's the problem? Where does DNS come into this? Well, so first off, the multiple DNS servers can all be compromised. Um, if, they were start, if they're serving bad data, you're going to get the bad data, and you're going to send the mail to the wrong place. Alice's mail server asks her, re, her own ISP's resolvers. And as you all know from cache poisoning attacks, that's a very, very common thing to have happen is that, that when DNS cache poisoning happens, it's the ISP's resolver that gets the bad data in them, even if the original servers are still serving the good data. So they can be compromised. And then you can have a man in the middle attack, somewhere in the middle, um, that is sitting there sniffing traffic or is managed to uh, insert one of those bad records and you get redirected straight, straight to the man in the middle. DNS is an easy way to get somebody to be your man, in, you know, to get to be a man in the middle for somebody else. So here's the answer. DNSSEC secures getting the right answer. So if, you're, if your zone is signed and your clients are validating, um, they get the right DNS answers. The man in the middle problem, however, you know, they can still pretend to be in the middle and you'll still send it to the wrong person. So that's where Dane comes in, because it makes sure that you're talking to the right certificate on the right server. So the vulnerabilities, recapping quickly, the MX record, the A record, and DNS records in general can be spoofed, including name servers and other stuff. And the DNS can redirect people right to the man in the middle. DNSSEC detects this, and it goes away. And eavesdropping is easy, because SMTP is actually unencrypted. Recent attempts at opportunic, opportunistic encryption have really helped. And what that really means is Alice's ISP will open a connection to Bob's ISP and say, hey, do you do security? And Bob's ISP will say, yes, I do security. Let's, let's talk encrypted. Well, that works really great up until the, the man in the middle says, no, I don't do security. And there's no way to detect whether Bob's ISP really should or should not do security. So you may just be talking to the man in the middle that says, I don't do security, and you just have to trust me. Um, so the man in the middle has all this control. Um, SMTP is unauthenticated by default. It's unencrypted by default. And you just have to believe the person you're talking to when they say, I don't do security. 
They can turn on opportunistic encryption, but it just doesn't help. And the CA-based solutions won't help. This, this is why Dane is the only solution. The CA-based solution doesn't help because not only does the man in the middle be able to say, I don't do security in the first place, so you don't even try certificate authority related attacks, but it's because if DNS is compromised, the MX records can direct you to the completely the wrong place in the first place. And you can get a record for anything, right? So, you know, if I'm example. If, if I'm trying to attack example.com, I can just say, hey, the MX record is evilguy.com. It's that simple. So you have to secure the DNS. DNS is, is there as an absolute bootstrap. So this is where Dane and DNSSEC, you know, solve all the problems. With DNSSEC, you can believe that the MX that you got was correct. You can believe that the TLSA Dane record is accurately pointing you to the right place. Yes, you want that place and you want that certificate. End of story. They don't have a choice. But even better, it tells you because they published the TLSA record, you must do security. So that man in the middle that originally was able to say, I don't do security, no longer can. Because now that the TLSA record is published, you've verified it through DNSSEC, you know positively you should expect security. So deployment-wise, so that's all, that's all said and done. The, the specification, I'm a co-author of it in the IETF, it's not even done yet. Um, it should be done in the IETF shortly. Having said that, it's already implemented. Um, it's, it's way ahead of its time. Um, Postfix 2.11, which was released in January, has it up and running. There's some quick configuration on the screen if you want to download the slides later to turn it on. Um, if you do turn it on, please do mail me. We are, you know, sort of keeping a list, and I'm proud to say there's like 270 fairly major um, organizations out there that have already turned Dane and SMTP on and are making use of it. Uh, please be 271, I would love that. And EXIM, which is the second most popular um, mail transfer agent out there, is expected to be finished in early 2015 with their implementation. So that takes care of you know, the vast majority of the implementations. So done with SMTP, let's talk about a couple of other protocols really quickly. Um, there's actually less information about them. XMPP is Jabber, if you ever use Jabber or XMPP. It also uses Start TLS. They have a recommended security solution. They're still sort of keeping the CA system, and they require security. So they don't allow the, the attacker in the middle to say, I don't do a, um, start TLS. But if, if you check the certificate authority chain and it doesn't work, their next best solution is to fall back to Dane. So in the, in the specifications they're documenting right now, they're recommending Dane as, as, a, as a mechanism to go forward. And there's a couple of drafts in the IETF now that are talking about that. Um, there is some deployed and running code. Prosody, I know, is one implementation of it. I believe there's more, but I, I didn't have the list available uh, when I looked at this. I need to go talk to the authors at the IETF in a couple of weeks. SIP. Um, SIP is a protocol for making um, session-based connections. Um, it's used for audio and uh, messaging and video and things like that. Um, they're sort of just getting started, but they know they want to use Dane. They know that this is sort of the right way to go forward in order to bootstrap all of their security as well. Um, it's not officially a working group item yet, but they're just starting to talk about it and they expect to start producing a document and hopefully the implementations will follow with that as well. Um, so that's it for me. Is there any questions? Um, that picture was taken in the last IETF in Toronto actually. Um, there's, there's lots of other protocols that use TLS. Those are just the first four that are getting started. I suspect that there will be more in the future that will look into it. Thank you. Uh, Jan Josh. Uh, thank you for this presentation. I think it's brilliant. When I, when I come back home, I will, I will try to set it up in my lab, at least for the mail. But my question is, um, you maybe know which DNS servers support the TLSA record serving Excellent question. So um, all of the current DNS servers support TLSA records. And really what that means, so all of the, the DNS servers for the last few years have had the ability to support a type they don't know. You can't list it as, as uh, TLSA if, if you have a really old server. You have to list it as type, and then there's a number code. I don't remember what the number code for the, for the Dane, um, for the TLSA record is. But 
so they've all been able to do it, but even all the most recent ones all already support TLSA and have for a couple of years. So unless you're running something really old, you're good. So Power, Power DNS supports it. I believe so, yes. Okay, then I need to try it. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? In my slides, there's a couple of other, um, there's a resource page right after the page you just saw. You're, you're welcome to go look at uh, URLs and documents later. Nope. Go ahead. Hey, Carlos again. Uh, since DNSSEC plays such an important role in this whole architecture, um, is there any way any countermeasure that you could apply in order to make sure that no, I would say, unsuspecting Dane user is uh, not validating the DNS queries they make? And I don't know, I'm not sure if, I, if I'm being clear enough. I mean, uh, ima imagine you have a, a web server, an email server uh, using Dane, and they query a recursive server, and that recursive server doesn't validate. Right now, um, there is, thank you for bringing that up because that's actually something I meant to mention earlier. Um, in terms of, of validating Dane and validating DNSSEC, there's multiple theories of thought as to whether you do it in the application, which is actually, we have a library um, and there's multiple libraries to do Dane and DNSSEC directly in the application. Not everybody wants to do it that way. In fact, the postfix implementation in the instructions requires you to have a locally validating resolver on the same box. So you have to trust the AD bit in, in, um, from the DNS packet and it has to come from a trusted path. That's a very good point. The documentation does spell that out um, and they're not the only ones thinking along that line. Uh, you, you get the caching benefit of multiple applications talking to one resolver, but um, e either way works as long as you have a trusted path to the validating resolver. Thanks. You bet. ISOC. So we, we had, or actually, I, I had a lot of expectations on, on Dane at the beginning and the uh, alternative to CA certificate authority. So you, you foresee, uh, as I read between lines, you foresee a future of, of usage among other services instead of the web because the browsers are less are reluctant, I would say, and uh, there are a lot of services that appear that are benefiting from, from it? It's a very good question. And, um, you know, the web was why Dane was originally sort of thought of. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, the, the web community has sort of decided they like the CA model. There's, there's a lot of money being transacted there and it's a political process and there's, there's user quickness, you know, issues and it, it's a lot harder than I think was originally anticipated. SMTP is clearly going to take off. Um, this is a list of some known, very large ISPs that are uh, ha that have published Dane records and have turned on um, validating Dane for SMTP. There's also a lot of talk about using Dane for looking up SMIME keys, and there's talk about using Dane for looking up PGP-related uh, stuff as well. So, and to be able to publish not just X509 keys, but to be able to publish keying material in general using a Dane record. So there's a lot of people looking at it for different reasons. Besides, the original reason is the web, interestingly enough, sort of kind of fell over dead, but there's all this other stuff happening afterwards that seems much more popular. So, thank you. I'm going to try to not destroy your TV set there. <laughs> it's um, not mine. Rob Seastrom again. Uh, I have a question which I sort of have been unclear on, even though I've been aware of Dane for some time. Does, if, if you are publishing a record that is not expected to go back up to a public CA, mm -hmm. or a certificate, you're referring to that certificate, does what is in the OU or CN field of that certificate no longer matter because you have said it's okay for that name via the DNSSEC signed Dane record? Excellent question. So if you publish a certificate usage type 2, which says I'm pointing at my private CA, so here's the certificate, here's my CA certificate, this is matching in the DNS. You have to trust the, the subject alt name would be preferable to the common name, but yes because then you're pointing at this parent certificate, you know, and to make sure that you're talking to the right server, you still have to have the common name or the subject alt name match. However, 
if it's type three, which says I'm pointing directly to the certificate, forget the whole X509 tree up ahead, you can actually publish one certificate, the name no longer applies. You've already looked up the name in the DNS. You've already looked up the fact that, you know, this is the name I want. There's no point in checking it. So that's, a lot of people believe that's an easier deployment option because you can produce one certificate with nothing inside of it and use it for, especially if you're a mail hosting provider with 10,000 clients, that's the easiest way to do that. But, but it does matter if you are, type two is to your own CA and type zero and one are public? Correct. Okay. So it still does matter it for type It still does for matter two. for zero, one, and two, yes. Okay. The other thing that doesn't matter for three is the certificate expiration time because the DNS tree already has a, a, a signature time right, plus right. TTLs so that they believe that that was sufficient and they don't need to check the expiration time on the, on the certificate for type Great. 3. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. Looks like I'm done. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I want to thank all the speakers again. If we could do one more round of applause for all of our, our great speakers, excellent speakers today. Thank you. Also, obviously, um, we wouldn't be able to be here and doing this today without uh, LACNIC and LACNOG, so I'd like to thank them as well. Um, and and uh, our Ion series sponsor, Affilius who's uh, actually committed to three years of sponsorship for the event. So if I can, for LACNIC and LACNOG and Affilius all, one more round of applause, and then we'll be on our way.